Okay, so we can start. So welcome every, everybody. Thanks for being here. So this is the first appointment of a series of seminars. We will keep you posted on the mailing list. And uh, the next one is uh, exactly in one month, uh, the 8th of March, if you want to um, save the date, uh, but you will, uh, you will get, you will receive more information. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm really happy uh, to have today Nicola Di Stefano and uh, Peter Van Kranenburg. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, as this is a, a series of seminars related to the Polyphonia project, uh, we, you know, the, the, the main topic is music, <laughs> the general topic is music. Um, let me also invite you for who is not uh, like uh, familiar with the project, I'm posting in the chat uh, the link to our website, you're very welcome to uh, visit it and uh, subscribe to the newsletter uh, if you want to be updated on uh, the advancement and uh, our research. Um, so the first speaker today is Nicola Di Stefano. Uh, he is a researcher at the Institute of Cognitive Sciences and Technologies uh, in Italy at Senar. Uh, Nicola um, is, uh, is a philosopher and uh, but he works uh, uh, before working at, uh, at the um, at CNR he, he was at the Institute of Philosophy and uh, Scientific and Technological Practice in Rome um, and his research focuses on uh, music perception and cognition he's author of many books and uh, uh, also teaches at the University of uh, um, Arkansas Rome Center and, uh, and also is involved in uh, uh, EU-funded projects, Combots and NEMA. Um, so today uh, is uh, presenting uh, his work on, uh, and the title of his presentation is An Interdisciplinary Approach to Music Perception and Cognition, Merging Empirical Aesthetics with bi Bioengineering. So thanks, Nicola. Uh, I will, uh, so you have 20 minutes. So they, uh, just uh, um, in, uh, uh, I will, uh, I mean, I don't know if you have your timer, it's okay. Otherwise, if you want, I can just uh, warn you when you have like five minutes uh, left. Yeah, maybe, maybe it would be better. Okay. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and then we will have the presentation from Peter and then we will have additional 20 to 30 minutes for discussion. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, mm, thanks Valentina for inviting me for the introduction. I'm very happy to, to be the first to join you in this beautiful initiative. Um, I assume that you can see the, the full slide. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'll go on. Um, I hope to give you an overview of, of the uh, topics that is related to the title that as you can see is much uh, broader than what I can say in 20 minutes, but I'll try to um, at least give, it, give you an idea of what I, I, I had in mind with, behind this title. So <clears throat> the presentation is, um, I would say, roughly divided into two uh, sections. The first one is related to cross-modal approaches in general and especially to music. And the second one is related to um, embodied approaches to music. Um, I think that I have to spend more time on the first one because the second one is, um, I would say, in the last, at least in the last 15, 20 years, 20 years, um, quite popular in, in, in musicology in general and in music studies. Um, and on the contrary, I think that cross modal approaches to uh, music perception are not so um, frequent in these years, although there are um, examples, of course. Um, so I would like first to motivate why I believe that cross-modal um, research is relevant for music-related issues. Um, to um, put it roughly, I would say that um, a large part of uh, uh, research effort in music perception and cognition uh, is aimed at the search for, uh, let's say, universals in music perception, 
and cognition. So for example, universality of scales or intervals or tonality, let's say. So we, we, we find in literature many, many articles trying to support the universality of several aspects in music perception and music theory. Um, and this is, I would say this is, or might be obtained in through different methods, but I think the two um, methods or approaches are uh, quite frequent. The first one is the cross-cultural one. So you try to demonstrate that the feature you're studying is present in more than one musical culture, uh, for example. And the second one is the developmental approach um, that allows you to, uh, let's say, demonstrate or at least to suggest that the perceptual or discriminatory ability that you are studying is present at the beginning of the uh, human development. Okay, so and you argue that therefore it is universal. Um, However, I think that um, if we use a cross-modal approach to certain features that we um, traditionally consider as musical features, such as, as I will consider in a while, for example, auditory roughness or consonance and dissonance, if we study them, those features in uh, a cross-modal fashion, then we, I think that we can somehow extend the validity of these um, perceptual um, features beyond music. So we kind of uh, demonstrate that these are universals in music because they are uh, not only musical features, but are present across uh, different sensory modalities. Uh, so there's this idea of amodal concepts or intersensory qualities, or um, to put it with Aristotle, of common sensible, that is that there are certain uh, stimuli, external stimuli or perceptual stimuli dimensions that are that can be picked up by different senses. Not this is not um, accepted by everyone. For example, Elmholtz, um, the famous uh, psychophysicist, um, wrote that the distinctions among sensations which belong to different modalities, such as the differences among blue, warm, sweet, and high pitched are so fundamental as to exclude any possible transition from one modality to another and any relationship of greater or less similarity. For example, one cannot ask whether sweet is more like red or more like blue. Comparisons are possible only within each modality. So Elmholtz argued against the possibility of a modal concept or intersensory quality. While, for example, a very famous passage from The Sense with Sensibility uh, by Aristotle supported the existence of common sensibles. Uh, he wrote, um, for the perception of magnitude, figure, roughness, smoothness, sharpness, and bluntness in solid bodies is the common function of all the senses. And if not all, then at least the common function of sight and touch. So Aristotle admitted the existence of common sensible. Um, in the, in the past, we have several attempts to bridge different um, sensory domains. For example, I'm giving you two examples. One by Field uh, in his Chromatics, published in, in 1835, and the other one by Thies. The first one um, correlates sounds and colors in a, in a quite precise manner. So Field aimed at building an harmony of colors and so he matched uh, pitches with specific hues of colors. And uh, with these strange figures, he was able to create uh, color harmonies um, using the same, let's say, the same or the corresponding uh, rules of musical harmony with creating chords. And on the right, you see the, the table of correspondence between uh, pitches and odors by Pierce, who was a famous um, chemist and, and performer. Um, we, we think that these um, table of correspondence both, both were rounded on, let's say, intuition and inner idea of harmonies. But we have many, many um, studies that um, statistically show 
that um, the certain matchings, for example, between uh, alders and pitches are consistent and are um, deliberately um, matched by participants. For example, in this uh, figure uh, that merges two different findings from uh, two different studies, you see that, um, for example, musk or dusk, dark chocolate is um, typically matched with lower pitches than, um, I don't know, uh, raspberry or lemon. And this is uh, something that you find in different um, studies. So why is that the case? Um, in, a, in, a, in a review that, that is in press uh, um, with Charles Spence, we investigated the meaning of harmony in different um, domains. So although it is quite obvious or accepted that the concept of harmony uh, is um, originally formulated in philosophy and then in, in applied to music. Uh, it is also um, frequently used in, um, in the visual domain and less frequently, although increasingly in the last years in, in the domain of flavors and, and gustation and olfaction. And so we kind of uh, tracked the most uh, frequent features in the across domains, and we were able to extract um, three general features that regard the that qualifies the use of harmony um, in cross disciplinary in cross um, modal context. And uh, we find we found that harmony is um, generally positively related to pleasure or pleasantness. Um, harmonic stimuli uh, go well together and they are um, processed um, fluently by the sensory system or more fluently than uh, non-harmonic ones. And this is clear in audition and in vision. Uh, while in other, um, especially cross-modal contexts, is not uh, yet investigated. So uh, similar um, results can um, also suggest future direction in, in the study of harmony in different, uh, in, in domains different from audition and vision. Uh, something similar, um, we are doing something similar with the, the concept of roughness that is related, as you know, with the concept of dissonance, since the, the explanation of consonance and dissonance provided by Helmholtz. But um, still in the auditory domain, we have um, relevant findings that show that roughness is a, a key feature of certain uh, human vocalizations um, like uh, screams or cries. And as such, these um, uh, signals, let's say, um, elicit aversive uh, uh, reactions in the listeners. So this might create a link between aversive reaction to dissonance, to musical dissonance, and to uh, rough auditory uh, stimuli. And we are extending these to uh, the domain of vision and touch, in which roughness is uh, often um, used to describe the, the surface texture that can be picked out by both uh, vision and touch. And in this sense, is an amodal feature in terms of Aristotle. And finally, in uh, gustation, where uh, roughness is often um, describing or associated to uh, astringency, that is a specific reaction due to particular um, responses of tongue, skin to uh, food. So the uh, underlying question is uh, whether there, there are similarities in the different uses of roughness across different modalities, and if these similarities can shed light on auditory roughness and on roughness in general. I like to mention these very uh, recently uh, published studies by Janos and colleagues published in Music and Science, and they um, compared they use different harmonizations of the same melody that you see uh, on bottom of the figure, 
um, the melody was harmonized in seven different um, ways that um, increased in roughness as they were more dissonant, for example, the one you see now. Um, and they asked participants to match each version of the melody to one of the 2D and 3D um, representation. Uh, and they found that um, more dissonant versions were consistently matched with more rough uh, 2D and 3D um, stimuli. Uh, another interesting finding in this um, field is the one by Sun and colleagues, and they uh, did the same thing comparing sound uh, varying in roughness with um, colors with use and they found, for example, that green is almost um, perceived as a non rough um, color that is it is matched with um, non rough sounds while, uh, for example, purple is matched with increasingly rough sounds. Um, we are currently um, carrying out a study. Um, on consonance and dissonance that uh, is cross-modal. And as you might know, um, consonance and consonances are typically perceived as a more fused and coherent stimuli, and therefore they elicit um, the, the EEG responses that are related to coherent percepts, that is the especially the gamma band um, activity. And so we are combining audio and video stimuli that varies in coherence uh, in order to see if the gamma band response is enhanced when coherent audio stimuli and coherent video stimuli are presented together. So uh, we have the, the coherent video is an action that is performed according to the afforded, uh, uh, the action afforded by the object. And here you see the non-afforded action. I'm gonna show you it once more, the afforded one and the non-afforded. And we took these as the coherent and non-coherent one, and then consonant and dissonance. And so we are exposing participants to uh, a number of different combinations, random combinations of these audio and video stimuli to see to evaluate the, the response, the EG response. I don't have any, any data on this because we have just six subjects to date. Okay. And then I jump to the second um, part of my, uh, of my presentation that is um, a shorter. Um, I don't think I have to spend much time on explaining why embodiment you actually have now five minutes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, embodying is relevant for music um, research. Uh, there are many, many, uh, I, I guess, uh, hundreds and hundreds of studies in this direction that suggest to investigate music perception um, using um, protocols that actively uh, involve participants. So. Uh, to close the loop between perception and action. And in this direction, we carried out a study um, some years ago involving um, young toddlers in which we gave the participants a, a toy that produced uh, consonant and dissonant sounds according to the degrees of rotation around the inch. And they were um, asked to freely interact with the toy and to play with the toy in a three phase experimental design. The first one lasted three minutes. Then in between you have a mute phase in which the sound was removed. And so the, the joystick was muted. And in the last phase, the, the, the device was in sounding mode again. And uh, we found that um, with the mute toy, the interaction uh, with the object decreases. So are not participants are not interested apparently in interacting with the mute uh, toy and um, and we found that there's an, um, a, a significant difference in the time spent in consonant versus dissonance position so 
uh, to us it seems that um, a, an experimental procedure like this uh, that in actively involved uh, participants is a more direct way to test consonant perception or maybe discrimination uh, rather than passive listening tests and finally the protocol we are um, carrying out uh, um, in these in these months um, involves violinists and we want to investigate how uh, musical expressivity and technical difficulty affect um, musicians, their, their state. And so I, I'm, I will show you the, the video that is much more clear than any explanation. So participants were asked to play um, excerpt of music of different uh, technical difficulty and emotional expressivity, and um, uh, they were um, they had sensors for monitoring physiological and movement parameters. And you see the sensors in this uh, other video on the right arm. And at the end of each excerpt, participants were asked to rate it for uh, musical expressivity and technical difficulty, of course. And then we uh, anal we combined all data and we um, ran a preliminary analysis with the, I guess, 12 participants today. And we it seems that, and, and I think this is interesting, that while um, movement, um, I would say, um, movement parameters um, um, are affected mainly by the expressivity or the emotional or musical expressivity of the of the pieces. Uh, physiological parameters are affected by um, by technical difficulty and musical expressivity. So, um, if the the, uh, the the analysis is confirmed with the with the whole sample. Uh, it could be interesting that uh, the, the emotional features that are the one, the ones that are traditionally related to physiological variations, such as heart rate uh, and uh, uh, respiratory rate and galvanic skin conductance and so on, seems to be predicted more by movement. Uh, and in that case, we recorded movement of the right arm, so not the vibrato, but only the the, the bowing. Uh, and I think that this could be an interesting uh, finding. You see the spark uh, on your left is the is an index of fluidity of movement, uh, and it decreases the fluid the fluidity or smoothness of the movement decreases with the increase of emotional or musical expressivity. Uh, okay, I think I can I can end it R and. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm happy to hear the next presentation and then question. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Really super uh, interesting. And we can only virtually <laughs> have a round of applause. Um, so I think it would be probably, if there are questions, we can take 10 minutes now uh, and discuss a little bit and then uh, change the topic, although of course they are related, but. Uh, if there are already questions, we can uh, we can spend you know up to ten minutes uh, for discussing now. So you can raise your hand. Okay, I see already one, Christian. 
Yes, uh, hello. Um, thanks for this very interesting talk. Um, I'm a statistician and I'm asking a statistician's question here um, because uh, you were commenting on the significance of certain relations. Um, you also gave us some data pictures that allowed us a bit to basically assess how strong these relations actually were, because you probably know that uh, significance in itself doesn't necessarily mean that uh, something is really meaningful. And I, I think one uh, important question here, particularly if you also talk about universals, is um, whether you actually are in a situation where uh, the variation between uh, different people, different participants is very large. And uh, I mean, even if you take them all together and you find a significant relationship, what may be is that there may be different groups of people where things work in a different way, right? Which, which isn't necessarily to be seen if they are all aggregated. And I I'm, was basically asking if you uh, also have, let's say, asked your data uh, for things like this. Okay, are you referring to a study in, in particular? No, and it's, it's, it's a general question referring to the results that you showed. Okay, so concerning the, la the last one, the, uh, you see that the, 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 the correlation is quite low, though it's apparently significant in some sense. But we are still running the, the, the analysis here also to um to let's say um because there are three different uh sources of physiological measures here so we are to first we have to select the most informative ones and then we put them into the analysis not to have a large aggregate of data but then i think that you also oh, refer to the the other one to this one, maybe I don't know. Um, I don't. I think that this was an ANOVA, and I think that um, it was tested quite. Mm, mm, I, I'm not a statistician, but quite um, typically with postdoc testing, Bonferroni like, and and so uh, the result was, I think, quite mm, strong. I think. But, but I mean, postdoc testing and Bonferroni don't do anything about the stuff I was talking to, right? So postdoc testing and Bonferroni basically make sure that the significances that you have are really significant, which is fine, right? I'm not, I'm not yeah. disputing that, but they don't say anything about this, uh, the strength of the effect and how it relates to the variation in the data. I mean, um, of course, uh, we don't have the time here to discuss this for long. I, I can just say, um, because I, I have also at some point worked uh, uh, with music and uh, I'm, I'm also doing cluster analysis, which is about finding groups and data. So basically, if, if you're interested to have a statistician uh, look at your data and your analysis, um, you can contact me and I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I would be happy. So were you referring to power analysis or something like this? Uh, no. No, okay. Okay, so maybe we can, uh, so that would be great if you get in contact, guys, and uh, maybe also go in depth in this uh, specific issue. But Enrico, you had, uh, you have your hand raised, so please go ahead. I thank you, Nicola, for, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Now, my question is about the association between uh, um musical features like consonance and dissonance and uh, and the examples we were making about roughness or so there are some associations that for which it's very it's very interesting to see that there is empirical evidence you know, between uh, but that are uh, uh, actually i would say quite intuitive you no know, i would associate you no know, rationally a uh, dissonant uh, sound with with a very uh, rough surface uh, and vice versa. So my question is, is this association something that has been studied at a conscious level? So users said, okay, there is this association, or you can find, uh, you have found evidence in a more like uh, empirical way, for example, EEG or, or other type of traces that, that yes, that, that people may or may not agree with at a conscious level. Yeah, good point. Now, most of them are um, findings on conscious associations. So deliberate associations, you 
typically you for example you hear a sound and then you see different shapes for example and you match the sound you hear with the shapes angular or rounded or you smell an odor and then you search for the pitch associated or in some case you have these um, discrimination test when you combine different uh, sensory information and see the result but um, i would say 95 percent are from um, deliberate choice um okay, miguel? Oh, sorry miguel uh, yes uh, hello uh, thank you for the um, presentation for me it was very interesting uh, even if i know little of the topic um I, I think at the beginning you mentioned um the study of um across different cultures of this kind of perception I, i'm i'm interested in, in your work on some somebody else's work um how this plays out so what are if uh, there are studies on differences in perceptions across different cultures so how much the this kind of um, uh, results um, about per music perception um, uh, basically are across different cultures or are specific to some culture yeah thank you this is a this is an oddly uh, debated topic especially in the last, I would say, five, six years after the publication of a study that appeared on Nature in 2016, that in which authors uh, tested um, native Bolivian um, population with um, stimuli varying in roughness, harmony, and, and consonance and dissonance. And they found that um, the Tsimane, this is the, the, the name of the population, uh, were um, apparently sensitive to roughness and to harmonicity of the stimuli, but not to the pleasantness of consonance and dissonance. So they were able to recognize how acoustic features of the stimulus, but they did not associate or match them to uh, pleasant, unpleasant uh, effects. And these opened or let's say amplified research in, in similar researches and someone else is uh, gathering or I think that ended together data from people in, um, in Papua Asia uh, last year again on consonance and dissonance. Um, while I find these uh, studies as um, fascinating and, and, and very intriguing I, I see that there are some, um, let's say, issues related to the, the translation of Western concepts uh, like harmony or consonance or even pleasantness uh, to naive population who may have one or five different uh, analogs in their, in their own language or culture. But there are many. I may I may send you uh, details if you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. So I actually had a question, but maybe uh, we will see if later we have some additional time, so we we can uh, like uh, spend the 10, 10 minutes and ten minutes, and then additional time for uh, you know other questions, mixed mixed session. Um, so I, if you have any other question for Nicola, save it for later because we may have some time to, to devote to it. Thank you again very much. Uh, you very much. Really, really interesting. Um, so Peter, maybe you may please share your screen. Um, so next speaker is Peter van Kranenburg from the KNAW, Netherlands. Um, Peter is, uh, so KNAW is, uh, is one of the partners of uh, Polyphonia. Uh, Peter is uh, an electrical engineer and a musicologist, and he, um, he worked on machine learning methods for studying musical authorship and, uh, and also developed music uh, melodic similarity measures. And, uh, and in Polyphonia, he's contributing both to work uh, on uh, analyzing similarities uh, in um, tunes, 
uh, and uh, uh, as well uh, uh, as in a, in a pilot, in a very nice pilot that we have about uh, extracting knowledge, uh, historical and uh, also technical knowledge uh, about uh, um, traditional organs, Dutch organs, um, from uh, from uh, uh, from text from uh, uh, text sources. Um, and also he contributed to a very important database of Dutch songs uh, uh, that, that um, uh, at the Martins uh, Institute where he works uh, as a researcher uh, beyond being also a lecturer at uh, Utrecht University. So he's going to present uh, uh, his work about some approaches to model melodic similarity. So thanks, Peter, uh, to be with us and uh, please. Go ahead. You have. Uh, do you want me to warn you when you have uh, five minutes left, or you have your timer? Um, no, I have a timer. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, about melodic similarity. Uh, Valentina asked me to uh, to present some of my own work, so that's what I will do. And before that, um, I will give an historical introduction with the history of the field I was active in, actually still am active in, which is, let's say, folklore research or uh, folk music research. And then I will present three approaches to melodic similarity, sequence alignment, uh, n-gram modeling, and a neural network approach. So let's, let's first have an historical introduction. And I would like to start with a quote by Samuel Bronson, Samuel Bronson was uh, a um, folk song researcher in the 1940s in the US. We will see his name later on, but I think this quote is quite telling uh, um, relating to music uh, melodic uh, similarity. What he says is all who have worked with the problems of variation in a related body of melodic materials will readily acknowledge that the question of relatedness well, the question of relatedness, of course, has to do with similarity between these melodic mater uh, materials. It involves far more than a mere note-to-note -note or accent-by-accent -accent correspondence. One very soon comes to realize that this is a problem of the utmost subtlety. I like that phrase, the up utmost subtlety, I think he is right, in which potentially are included all or most of the elements constituting melodic identity, range, melodic and rhythmic mode, number of phrases, patterns, phrasal combinations, refrain schemes, cadence points, and so on. <clears throat> so although this is more than 70 years old, this quote, I think it's still right. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, melodic similarity is still a, a, um, a matter of the utmost subtlety. And it's also very much contact dependence. And uh, so the context from I am from, from, from which I'm talking now is the context of studying melodies in uh, folk music collections. Um, so to talk about melodic similarity in general, like the universals uh, that we refer to, uh, is, is I think it's unsolved how to how to do that. And uh, it's very interesting, but uh, well, on a practical level, uh we all always need to contextualize this kind of work um so this field of research started at the end of the 18th century with johann gottfried von herder and the brothers Grimm and other romantic um, um romantic uh, uh, authors at that time and um Herder philosophized about this and he um he stated that folk song is the mirror of the soul of the people. And he used the word, the, the word Geist, so the Volksgeist, let's say the, the collective mind of a uh, Volk, of a people. And what he says is this collective mind can be found in the folk songs. So this is a very idealistic approach, but it was very influential uh, deep into the 20th century. And um, what they started to do is to search for these authentic folk songs because there you can find the the mind of the people the folks guys and these um, these authentic folk songs were um, were supposed to come from oral transmission because that's real written is artificial right oral is real 
uh, popular. So it's from the folk, there's variation, they are anonymous, they are created by the folk, right? Um, so that's, um, or, that's caused uh, a number of folks and collectors to, to do field work and to collect, to go to villages and to farmers and to peasants, mostly out, out of the cities, and to, um, to collect folk uh, material, also folk tales, of course, the Brothers Grimm, but now we're focusing on folk songs. Um, Heather himself published a few books with uh, mainly texts, but later on in the 19th century, uh, collectors like Ludwig Erck and uh, Franz Böhme, they started to collect and publish melodies. And in the 20th century, with the invention of the phonograph and later the, the, the tape recorder, um, these field researchers, they, they started to make recordings and, uh, and transcriptions. Now, if you have a pile of transcriptions, then you need somehow to store them. And in the pre-computer uh, age, a database looked like this. Um, it's, it's a card, uh, card file. And um, by storing information in such a card box system, you are forced to make a linear ordering. So now with in, the, uh, in, in the current time with the computers, we are not forced to make linear orderings. You can just have uh, data in any order and sort it however we want. But when you establish an uh, archive like this, you have to choose some ordering and some key to find um, uh, to find the items you, you uh, and of course also to uh, store the items you uh, you want, uh, you're interested in. This calls the question, and in 1900, uh, Dutch musicologist Daniel Schurleer organized a competition. And he asked the question, what is the best method for the lexical ordering of folk and folk-like tunes? Um, and there were uh, a few uh, respondents and the most influential was by Ilmari Kroon, um, a Swedish, I think a Swedish uh, folk song researcher. And his proposal has, um, has influenced many of these classification systems to come. His idea was to take the cadence tones of the melodies and use those as sorting keys. So actually, this is already roughly a music similarity measure, um, taking the sequence of cadence tones, because um, in his idea and also in his experience, um, the cadence tones in melodies are more stable, more uh, less changeable than other parts of the melodies in, in transmission, in cultural transmission. So if you have this sequence of cadence tones, you have kind of a skeleton of the melody, which you can use to compare a melody with other melodies, and of course, to order melodies. This system was later on adapted by Bella Bartok. Bella Bartok was a very important folk song collector. He, um, he did field work in, in uh, Bulgaria, in Romania, in Hungary, of course, uh, with the phonograph. And then, well, in his institute, he transcribed all these recordings and he also made a, a system of ordering, which also is based on the cadences, the scale degrees of the cadences. Um, this is an example from um, a, a melody with, with four, uh, four phrases. And the primary key was the mid cadence, so the, the final note of the, the second phrase. And then the secondary keys were the internal cadences, uh, the first and the second part. And then there's um, a number that tells that the, the lines have eight syllables, and this is the range of the melody. And by this encoding, he, he also had a way to order the melodies. And by doing so, uh, find clusters because if you order the melodies uh, according to such a scheme, similar melodies end up uh, near to each other. So that's what that's what they hoped with these systems to find uh, to find similar melodies and group them together. Many of those systems have been uh, uh, proposed during the 20th century, uh, but no system 
emerged that is able to let's say solve all <laughs> classific uh, all classification problems or or, or or all ordering problems so in the end it remained kind of an unsolved um, uh, question uh, this is an example i would like to show of uh, early computation so bernard Johnson, the same of the same author of the the quote i started with he did an experiment in the 40s with uh, punch cars, um, which enabled him to, to uh, uh, explore different kinds of sortings. And uh, well, these are based also on uh, melodic um, uh, features like uh, the scale degrees in the phrases, rhythmic features, cadence tones, accent sequences of accented tones, things like that. Um, unfortunately, he only describes his methods. There are no at least I didn't find any publications of him um, showing uh, um, or is it clear results, but um, at that time already they were experimenting with, with let's say, computational uh, approaches. Um, there's one concept that we need to know to understand the, the uh, what, what I will talk about, the, the approaches to similarity, that is tune family. And in oral transmission, I skipped this definition. I will explain it with this. In oral transmission, a melody is from mouth to ear to mouth to ear, right? And in that process, uh, the melodies change. And all the instances of a melody that are connected historically in this chain of transmission are called a tune family. And of course, there's interaction between tune families. There can be material from one tune family go into another tune family in this process of oral transmission. But the tune family is a group of historically related uh, melodies. For example, like this. These are all melodies that are the same, have the same identity, but in the process of transmission, uh, differences uh, occur. Um, OK, let's first talk about sequence alignment. So the first of the three computational approaches I will present. Um, if you look in uh, folk music research literature, alignments like these are all over the place. So this is from a paper by uh, Viora, um, and he used this example to illustrate the way he believed two melodies uh, are related to each other by notating them in score, and the corresponding notes uh, are uh, let, uh, uh, vertically aligned. So more more in abstract um, if you have two sequences let's say we have a sequence x of seven symbols and a sequence y of six symbols we can construct an alignment by finding relations between the symbols so in this this is one possible alignment so the first uh, element of x is related to the first element of y apparently the second element of x does not have a correspondent symbol symbol in y the third um, element of x is related to the second of y etc so this is another possible alignment this is still another possible alignment you can compute how many there are possible it's quite a lot so the question is how to find the alignment you want you would prefer and by doing that we have to realize that there are two operations that are in play when making alignments that is either inserting a gap or making an association between two uh, two symbols. So um, the way to do this computationally is to assign scores to those operations, so gap insertion and association, and then um, just adding the scores of all the individual um, alignments, aligned symbols, and then the the alignment, the best alignment is the one with the highest score. There's an algorithm that can efficiently find that optimal alignment. It's needle and niche algorithm. It's very much related to edit distance, but this is different because there's not only, a, let's say, a penalty for uh, editing a symbol, but there's only also a reward, a score for um, for associating, uh, so positively for associating two symbols. What are those symbols? Well, in the case of melodies. We, the, the, we can take the notes as symbols, and each note has a number of properties. So we can use those properties to compute 
these uh, association scores. So let's have an example. These are two uh, versions of a melody. So that's here. Here's an ornament in the second uh, version. So if you, if you make an alignment based on scale degree, which says if the notes have the same scale degree, uh, we want them to associate, to align. We give them score one, for example. And if um, and if, if we insert a gap, we give that the score minus a half. It's quite kind of arbitrary choice, but well, we can play with that score scheme. But then if we uh, use only pitches, we see that uh, the alignment goes fine up until here. And then we see that the this structural melody note is indeed aligned with this structural melody note, but the next note is aligned with the note in the ornamentation, which is not what we want. So we can make a more advanced um, a scoring scheme. Um, I skip this. For example, this is what we want, right? We want um, this melody note to align with this melody, melody note, this melody note align with the first of the ornamented group, and this melody note to align with this, no, the let's say the second structural note. And the scoring scheme, the features um, I used for this are the pitch, the metric weight, and the position in the phrase. So using those three uh, features of the notes, we can construct uh, an alignment that ma musically makes sense. And um, I evaluated that on the Dutch corpus, which has um, a large number of tune families by computing, a, uh, taking a query melody, computing alignment with all the melodies in the corpus, and then see to what extent the melodies from the same tune family are at top of that rank list. Um, and this scoring scheme I just showed you has a quite nice uh, performance in terms of uh, mean average precision. Um, it's not perfect, but um, it, it shows that alignment can be used to find melodies from the same tune family. Um, this method is incorporated in the database of Dutch songs. Um, you can visit that, the URL is, is here. I skip this because I have to hurry a bit. So the next approach is um, engram modeling. And engram modeling, um, I was in a project using that for a similarity, but on a different corpus, namely medieval chant. And we, we know that as Gregorian chant, but Gregorian chant is actually a construction made around 800 in uh, order of Charlemagne who wanted unity in his empire. So he replaced all kinds of local singing traditions, local liturgical traditions with Gregorian chants. Um, so there are different traditions of medieval chants. Um, well, this is what we're talking about. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, so we created the data set with melodies from Gregorian chant, from Old Roman chant, from Milanese chant, Beneventum chant, and Mozarabic chant. These are local chant traditions. And um, um, well, this is how we represented the melodies in using the full piano font. So if you type this in uh, Word, for example, and you change the font to full piano, you, you see this. So it's a very elegant way of encoding and visualization uh, at the same time. Um, now, for engram modeling, um, if you, for example, have a sentence, the grass is, and we wonder about the continuation of that sentence. Could be the grass is happy, the grass is green, the grass is blue, the grass is empty, the grass is dry. Then, well, we know given our knowledge of uh, English language and uh, let's say our common knowledge of the world that a continuation of green, the grass is green, has a higher probability than the continuation like the grass is happy. And this is the core the essence of engram modeling. We can of course do the same for melodies. If we have a few notes, then the question is what is the most likely next note? And um, we can try to, to 
um, to ex extract a model, to construct a model, a probability model from a corpus of uh, melodies. Um, so if you have a sentence, like a sentence of seven words in this case, um, we use these engrams to model the probability of, for example, the fourth word given the second and the third, the probability of the fifth word given the third and the fourth, etc. And these probabilities we learn from a data set. And we can do that for music as well. So we used our uh, medieval data set to train these probabilities using the intervals between the notes in semitones as our vocabulary. And then, for example, we can uh, find what is the probability of this minus three, which is a minus uh, uh, descending minor uh, third, given the preceding uh, intervals, etc. And then um, to have one single number for the entire sentence, we can use the, um, the perplexity, which is a kind of average probability inverted for an entire sentence. Now, for example, if we take this Gregorian melody and we compute the perplexity given a model trained on Gregorian chants, on our Gregorian chants, we find the perplexity of uh, 3.99. But if we compute perplexity given a model trained on old Roman chants, we find perplexity of 6.47, which is much higher. So this melody better fits within the Gregorian corpus than in the um, old Roman corpus, which gives a similarity measure between a melody and the corpus. Now we can uh, explore those perplexities, of course, and see what are the outliers, which are the the, the melodies that do not fit in their own corpus and do all kinds of interesting observations there. Also can use it for classification. If we classify each melody to the, uh, to the tradition that has the lowest um, um, perplexity, then we, we have a very high uh, performing classifier of chance uh, for, uh, for their traditions. So apparently these traditions have local correspondence, local structural coherence, because we use only five intervals all the time um, and show similarities of the melodies within uh, these corpora. Okay, finally. Just to know yeah. how long you need, because it's already, we five. passed the time. Okay, yeah, I think four or five minutes, is it okay? three okay I, I i speed up <laughs> okay i just want to make sure that people don't have to go and yes. we have time for some discussion yes yes i go quickly over this um so the last approach is a neural network approach we take an um a recurrent neural network in goes uh, a sequence of feature vectors and out comes uh, also a feature vector, which is a uh, point in a space. Let's say it is uh, the red point is this melody. And then if we have a point in a space, we can of course compute distances to other melodies. Now we trained this neural network with a doublet loss function, which means we put two melodies in. And if the two melodies are from the same tune family, we, um, we want them to be close in the space. If the two melodies are from a different tune family, we want them to for, be further apart. So then if you, um, um, you can express that in a loss function like this, um, which then in the end, we, um, um, we evaluated this according to tune family membership in the same way as alignment. And we find similar performances in, in terms of uh, mean average precision um, all around 0.7, right? And um, the nice thing of, of this neural network approach is that it it's creates an abandoning space. So we can, um, we can examine where in, the, where in the space melodies from the same tune family end up and most cluster, but some uh, tune families apparently are uh, bit more distributed and uh, well that's something nice to explore which ends my talk so 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. Sorry about that, but um, okay. yeah, just to make sure that, um, and um, thank you very much for the nice um, presentation and also the nice um, historical um, introduction. Um, so as um, before, uh, if you have um, questions, just uh, raise your hand. Mm. Enrico, please go ahead. Hi, thank you, Peter, for, for, for the presentation. It was very, uh, very interesting. So now my, my question is on uh, uh, when, you, when you talked about the alignment between melodies, the, the alignment approach for comparing similarities of melodies, you were referring to using the exact pitch as a reference across melodies. So is there the assumption that all the melodies are on the same, uh, let's say, key or the same tone, or the transposition is not something that could... Uh, that could be supported or what, what, what's the reason why the exit pitch and not trying to get some relative uh, position in the melody something like that yes um yes i made this uh, transposition invariant by uh, just computing the computing 12 alignments for each melody right with all the all the shifts and then taking the one with the lowest actually with the highest oh, okay so essentially it was a pre-processing step where all the melodies were kind of aligned in terms yeah. of uh, absolute peace okay thanks one could use scale degree of course to also to circumvent that but yeah then you need to establish the key and if you don't have that annotated well you need something else and it this works yeah Yes, Andrea, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Peter. I, I found it very uh, inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, have you uh, tested and evaluated the, all these three approaches that, that you, you have just shown us um, we, on, uh, on the same data set? And how do the, if so, how do these approaches um co compare to each other from a per performance point of view yes so the, the alignment and the neural network we uh compared because they were they were evaluated on the the date the, the, the Dutch song collection um i did not apply the engram methods to the to the Dutch song collection yet Maybe I will never do, uh, maybe if I have some time, because I do not have high expectancies of that. But the neural network and alignment, they, um, they performed comparable. Yeah. And if I can, a follow up question. Um, these approaches, I imagine, at least for the alignment and the engrams, are only tested on monophonic. Uh, tunes. Uh, did you make any experiment on polyphonic music or counterpoint or uh, something that is not monophonic? No, this this was all work on collections of melodies, so it was all monophonic. Yes, Thank but you. of course you can apply those methods, but then you have to find a way to define the symbols, the sequence of symbols. In in uh, let's say in, a, in an appropriate way, it, it it's it's basically a, a matter of uh, encoding. Yes, yes, the, the the algorithms themselves are very flexible. They are abstract, so a symbol can be anything, okay. even high level patterns. Thank you very much. Yes, Nicola. Yes. Thank you for your talk. I was, I was, I'm interested in and curious about the the notion of melodic similarity, and I was wondering whether um, there's a, there exists a shared and and accepted uh, view or concept of melodic similarity that you can use to assess whether your computational algorithm works or. Uh, does not work in in detecting similarity, how can you do that the. Okay, did the, the algorithm work 
or not? Yes, uh, by my knowledge, there, there is no such, let's say, commonly accepted uh, conceptualization of, of similar, melodic similarity. That's why, um, why, he presented, why I presented from this context of folk song research. In this context, it makes sense. And if you take the tune families as similar melodies, then it makes sense. But um, in general, I think it's very difficult to, uh, yeah. But maybe you, you, you yourself <laughs> can tell more about that. From, I mean, from a music cognition perspective, it is, um, um, that's of course a complete. Yeah, I think that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are, I think that there are many, uh, many possible, uh, let's say, perspectives uh, to tackle uh, on, on similarity. Of course, melodic similarities seeming, seemingly restrict the, the, the possible perspective, but I think that still you have uh, uh, different possibility to, to, to conceive it. And maybe, maybe also, a, a, let's say, a blind approach, a data-driven or computational blind approach may, may help us in, define, in defining similarity. Yes. OK. Is there any other question? Maybe, you, let's say, even mixed to Nicola and the Peter. Uh, if you had any questions also from before. Um, I actually saved the one question for Nicola. So maybe I can um, now take the chance. So you, I, I was um, curious um, about the, um, uh, the experiment that you showed on, on uh, dissonance and consonance. And actually my question is probably very naive, but uh, um, so dissonance, uh, um, so I was wondering, uh, uh, dissonance are, are not as, uh, perceived as such as they are, if they are put in context sometimes. So why do you think it's um, like, you know, they are uh, uh, generous, you know, certain uh, sounds are um, universally dissonant. Uh, it, this, is, this is a bit hard for me to, to get because I think it's, uh, it's like it depends on the context where you put it, right? Yes, yes, uh, yes, and no. I would say um, that is. It, mm, of course, there are many different uh, contexts in, in in which you can test uh, consonance and dissonance. So uh, you can test in, in in a melodic context, for example, referring to the previous talk, or in harmonic context, or um, changing timbre, for, for example, or or rhythm, etc. But in general, um, the effect of uh, um, dissonant sounds is clearly perceived by the listener, also in uh, when put in context. So the perceiver uh, typically recognizes uh, dissonances in context and may rate them as pleasant or, mm, I don't know, as more pleasant than in isolation but still they are able to distinguish between consonances and dissonances. I think I see what you mean. Um, okay, so is there any other question? Uh, can, can I follow your question? Okay. Uh, probably we already discussed that, but it's always a, a, a kind of a, a puzzles me. So I, I make a very, very, uh, basic example. Let's take a, a C chord, okay, that is typically made as a triad with the C, M, E, and E, and G. But then you add the C, the B. Sorry, I'm switching between Italian and English. Um, then it becomes a C major seventh. Mm -hmm. Then when you play C major seventh and C, based on this uh, expectation, the the listener should tell you that the C major seventh is more uh, dissonant, at least if you put uh, uh, the chord in a, in, a way, in a way in which C and B would be uh, close to one uh, each other. 
Uh, is that already uh, yeah. proved somehow? Yeah, I would say yes. So they perceive it as more of this one. But yeah, I can, I can imagine that. Anyway, I, I am afraid that there is something also in, that, in the way you tend to attribute this uh, dissonance, no? Because for, for, for a jazz player, that doesn't make any sense. So unless you put some uh, uh, non, uh, the chord, the, in the chord, some note that is not in a scale, but um, uh, probably the, the, the C major seventh is not dissonant at all. It would say they are too different. Or maybe it, it would say, I would say the C triad is simplistic, is not more, less dissonant than, than the, the yeah. C major. So there is also, you know, the, the, not the cultural, but actually your, your kind of uh, way of uh, perceiving or producing sound that may change it. Um, I don't know, it, I always think that there is something more than just the pure, uh, although I agree with you that basically if you just play a bi chord, then of course, it is different if you play C and B flat, C and B flat and C and B. Of course, that will be different. But anyway, just a uh, yeah. Matthew. Yeah, this is this is a, a good point because of course we always um or, or we tend to uh in create experimental design that are um clear and sharp and, and therefore are quite abstract with respect to our daily practice of music. Uh, but let's make an example from a different context. If you are used to eat a spicy food, uh, you might be used to it, but you still perceive that it is spicy, I think. Uh, so it, it remains spicy, uh, but then you like it and, and you enjoy it more and more spicy, uh, but it still uh, remains spicy. So something similar, I assume that would happen with, with consonants and dissonance. Uh, we should uh, disentangle maybe between dissonant and unpleasantness. And the recent studies show that we have to disentangle this because a jazz player would enjoy probably more dissonant and more complex, as you said, uh, sounds rather than major triad that is quite Mm, irrelevant or, or insignificant, I would say. James? Yeah, picking up on the same point, you know, we, we get used to dissonance and our, our perception of dissonance has changed over centuries. Some centuries ago, you know, a major third was a problem. Um, so in the sense, jazz players are farther into the future than the rest of us. Yeah. Uh, okay, I say, well, I mean, we, we're running late, but uh, if you allow me, I would have uh, just uh, one question for Peter, as I don't see any hands raised, so I, I jump in, and um, it's a very general question, so you know that in our project, uh, we have the challenge to identify patterns in music, uh, and uh, these patterns clearly may have uh, uh, relevance to the similarity problem, not to identify the tech similarities or classifying music. So I was uh, wondering if you see, um, so the, 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 the methods that you showed, especially the last ones, uh, well, very well known to be black boxes. So if we want to understand why, you know, certain things are found to be similar, do you think it is feasible in any way to encode the input to have some, let's say, more explainable or at least some hypothesis on why certain things uh, comes out uh, in a certain way? Or, or do you see this um, very, you know, uh, or, or maybe having, or maybe, let's, see, let's put it this way, do you think we can use like um, neural networks on um, uh, on aspects that uh, are less uh, um, semantics and then add up to the results some more deductive uh, or uh, um, uh, yeah, deductive approach, something that can be more explainable uh, to the results. Thank you, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I haven't done much thinking about that, so I have to. Uh, but what always, what I can imagine is that for certain subtasks, 
you can train neural networks, for example, maybe detecting the occurrence of a pattern. Um, if the pattern is well de well defined, maybe. Um, and um, of course, there are all kinds of efforts to uh, do explainable AI. I'm not that familiar what, with, with that field to know what the progress is, but uh, what I've seen is promising. So that might also um, um, give methodology to use neural networks and at the same time be able to understand what the predictions and the, the classifications these, these networks make. So yes, <laughs> but that's more concrete than this. Uh, I'm afraid I can't, uh, <laughs> I don't have uh, thoughts at the moment. Thank you. I mean, it, uh, clearly it's an open problem. I just uh, wanted to yes. share the thought and if you had uh, any, you know, if you have had any thinking about it, uh, uh, we're doing something with uh, uh, Delfina, who is uh, here in uh, Connected. Uh, she's a PhD student in computer science. We're doing something like this, but more on uh, images. So it's another um, domain, but still, I think that in general, the approach may be similar. So like identifying things that uh, you know neural networks are very well very good at like for example for images would be pixels okay and uh, or uh, the, the the certain uh, certain um, um, so the shape like the detection of objects that uh, are very dependent on the shape uh, and the position and uh, uh, while certain other things that are more uh, like related to the interpretation that you give may be dependent on other features and you want to ex make them explicit to, to make sure that you uh, you can explain why certain things are classified in a certain category which is more related to interpretation uh, you know and uh, semantic interpretation of them and i was just uh, thinking maybe this can be applied i mean we don't know if this is going to work but uh, this is our this is our idea but uh, I, I was thinking maybe this can be applied also to our project as an experiment, maybe with Andrea uh, and you, uh, we can try something like that. Oh, there is uh, Christian uh, with, uh, so let's allow a last question. Uh, uh, yes, um, then... so, sorry, I, I kind of, I, I took part in quite a number of these sessions and there's a proud tradition to totally disregard the time constraints. So I thought I could- yeah, No, I know, that. but I, I don't want to. <laughs> um, so, so this is a bit of a follow-up. Um, if if I understood uh, the definition or the the uh, the neural network approach correctly, um, the main thing that governs this is the loss function, and the loss function is based uh, on uh, whether melodies are this in the same tune family or not. Right. So that basically means that um, uh, what this gives you is, is it gives you a similarity measure that is basically the optimal one that you can use in order to make this distinction. And now I'm asking, um, so uh, how uh, confident would you be that the similarity that you get in this way is also suitable for doing all kinds of other things you might want to do with the melody similarity, right? Because I, uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure whether this is what you have in mind, but you may actually have in mind this as a method to def define a general similarity measure with which you may also want to do all kinds of other things. Um, and, and then the question is, if the loss function only is based on this one problem, how will this generalize to um, other problems? Yes, but yes, um, but this idea of tune family, and also, if you if you would examine the, the the collection and how diverse the melodies are that are in one tune family, and still by a human observer they will be um, recognized as the same melody, then I, I would have some confidence. Of course, it depends on the purpose, but um, at least. The, the kind of diversity that is in these tune families corresponds to the, let's say, the, the flexibility in perception to still recognize a melody as, well, the same, right? Same is problematic here, but yeah. So I think it has meaning beyond uh, folk song research.
Okay. Um, very well. So, is there any other question? Uh, I mean, I agree with you, Christian. I mean, we don't. We can discuss uh, for as long as we as we want. The important thing is that we had we gave the chance to anybody to discuss and make questions and have the presentations. But clearly, I guess that uh, there are people who want to go home. I don't know. But anyway, if uh, there is any other question. Um, in the okay, in the meantime, before we say goodbye, so first I want to really thank you all to be here and for so long, and uh, Peter and Nicola for the really interesting uh, um, uh, presentations. Really, thank you so much. Um, and um, let me remind you again: if you want to uh, keep post, be posted, you know, stay tuned. Let's say and uh, stay be updated. Um, on the progress of the project and our research. You can um, follow us on Twitter or uh, subscribe to the newsletter. You just go on the home page and scroll down the, the, the main page and you can find you know, the, these details. You're very welcome to follow us and, uh, and interact with us. Uh, and, um, and I think we will, uh, you know, I mean, I think we plan to publish uh, or to post these uh, seminars on uh, our YouTube channel. So in case, you know, some of you asked me because they could join only later. So it would be also disseminated through the channel. Um, so thank you again. Uh, maybe we can, uh, we can close this. I don't see any. Uh, other hands raised, and uh, I hope to, to see you again uh, in uh, in one month for the next uh, appointment. Thank you, thank you very much, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.